speaker is uh, uh, Robert Kozik, and uh, we're going to be convexly optimized. So. That's right, like a big bowl. Uh. Uh, I've been working on this with my collaborators from here, uh, Ali Reza Shabani and Daniel Lidar. Uh, they haven't worked on this, so we're going <clears> to <throat> see if I can convince you that we can take this away and speed up some of these optimization methods. Um, I really like this statement from the talk by Feynman, in particular the two things I've highlighted in red. And uh, more specifically, specific is very important for optimization. The more specific we can be, about what the system is, the, the better the optimization is, is going to work. Uh, we're not quite there yet in terms of the kind of models I'm going to show because it's too generic, but I think that's a direction. Um, so there's two things that optimiza optimization can do. One is you can handle uncertainty in the uncertainty, <laughs> i.e. you can make the codes robust. And the second thing you can do is determine if a particular amount of real estate in terms of encoding or qubits is sufficient to actually get you to where you want to be in terms of uh, fidelity. So you'll see that, that, we, that we can do this. So the outline is uh, I'll formulate the problem, talk about direct fidelity maximization, and then indirect fidelity minimization, which is the, oh, I shouldn't say maximization. Well, yes, it is indirect fidelity maximization. It's really the central piece of this talk. Some examples and a few concluding remarks. So the setup is uh, the standard setup. We have a recovery, an error, a set of errors, and an encoding, and they're all uh, CP maps that are trace preserving. And the goal is to select the OSR elements in the recovery and the encoding so that the map from the system state coming in to the system state coming out is as close as possible to a desired unitary, which I've labeled U sub S. Now, I ought to say, since my background is control engineering, that um, this is the only thing missing. This is like, to me, a little bit the elephant in the room. Every, every time you want to do something in quantum system, you have to spray control. But we won't get into that. I, but I did want to show you this slide because I really enjoyed making it. <laughs> if you're familiar with the book, it's Ubik or Ubik. Anyway, all right, so into the details. Uh, the first point is uh, fidelity. So we're going to use uh, this uh, entanglement fidelity, which I've probably incorrectly called on many occasions the average fidelity. But it's a very good measure of performance because, of course, it's completely dependent only on the elements of the channel. Uh, related to it is the following fact, that for perfect fidelity, the channel should be proportional to the desired unitary. And of course, everything has to sum to one for completeness. So this leads to an indirect measure of performance, which I'm just calling the distance measure, although it's distance squared. But So these are related, and we'll see that in a, in a short amount of time, I hope, short. So you can uh, envision two problems. One is, uh, let's maximize fidelity over the recovery and encoding OSR elements, or minimize the distance over the same, plus this extra little bit here. And <clears throat> the point is that both of these problems can be solved for local solutions via a biconvex iteration, particularly semi-definite programs. We'll have been working on this. Uh, there'll be some more about, uh, particularly about this, uh, on Friday uh, from Peter Shore and Andrew Fletcher, although I think they're going to talk more about the implementation than the process. I'm going to talk more about the process, what, how the optimization works, what it's doing. So let's look at direct fidelity maximization. It's not a convex problem for a number of reasons. The most prominent is the constraints are quadratic equalities. Those are not convex sets. So we can get out of the problems in a, kind of a standard way, uh, to some extent, which is we, we, change the, um, we change into a basis representation of the encoding and recovery through fixed bases, and then form process matrices, which are essentially uh, the quadratic uh, version of the elements of the coefficients of these expansions. The problem is still the same. Nothing has changed except the form, except here you can see now the uh, fidelity is, is linear in either one or the other. It's a bilinear function. And we can benefit from that in the following way. If we relax the quadratic inequalities to semi-definite constraints, which they have to be, 
then we now have at least eliminated those. And you can see if we fix encoding or fix recovery, we're going to have a semi-definite program to solve for these rather large matrices in most cases. So for example, uh, the relaxed version of the uh, recovery problem is given the encoding, given the error, this is a semi-definite program. Now here's the interesting part, is you can recover so it's, it's a relaxed problem. That means the fidelity you get is guaranteed to be an upper bound on the fidelity you would get under the constraints. However, you can take the recovery matrix and through a singular value decomposition, or in this case an eigenvalue decomposition because it's a positive semi-definite, recover the recovery OSR elements, which means you, now, you actually have solved the problem. So this is the optimal solution for fixed encoding. Reversing it, fix the recovery, you can solve for through the semi-definite program, the, the uh, encoding matrix. So the algorithm would look like this if you wanted to iterate. So you start with an encoding. You could start with a recovery, turn it into a process matrix, solve the SDP for the recovery process matrix, stick that into the SDP for the encoding and just keep iterating. And you're guaranteed in each step never to decrease the fidelity and you can increase it. And you stop this when the fidelity stops increasing. So you found a local solution. We don't know the conditions yet for global. Uh, there's some hints at that. And there's also no, uh, it's not clear that it's unique either. In fact, I think it's not. And then at the end of this, you would terminate and extract from the uh, process matrices the recovery encoding OSRs and figure out some way to implement it through, I don't know what, but that's another issue. Um, so let me add on top of this now the robustness concern. So let's say we had a set of error models and we wanted to design over the set. The set could come from various tomography experiments. It could come from a physical model, a Hamiltonian of some kind, dependent on some parameters, and we just make a huge list. And that would or take a sample out of that set. And there are ways to try to get the worst case sample, which I'm not going to get into. So that would be the way to incorporate the uncertainty in the error model. <clears throat> and you could then have a worst case, an average case, or something else. But the worst case, these problems still remain convex problems. So the worst case is to maximize the worst case fidelity over the set of, of error models. Or the average case, you simply average, average the error model. So these are the two problems. I'll focus the rest of the talk on the average case. It's a little easier to visualize. And the differences are small, although in some cases they're interesting. So that was the direct method. I want to talk about the indirect method. And for here, it's convenient to think of the encoding and the recovery as these big unitaries. And we can always organize this so that, and we'll do the unitary encoding, so that the first NS, NS being the, the dimension of the Hilbert space of the system, the first NS columns of this, of the uh, encoding unitary, are the code words. They're all orthonormal. And uh, similarly, the first NC columns of the recovery unitary are the OSR elements of the recovery matrix. So here are the OSR elements for encoding is one element, and here there are some number labeled MR. So now the distance measure simplifies a bit, and you can write it out in a sort of tensor product form. And so again, now we're trying to, what we want to do is solve for R, C, and alpha, which satisfy the various constraints. So this is the indirect fidelity minimization problem. And again, it's because of the quadratic equality constraints, we're not dealing with a convex problem. Although it, it's worth noting that in this particular form, we're already uh, let's say trilinear. If we fix any two, we have a third variable in red that's linear in the, or affine in the cost function. So you can optimize this over R and actually get a different form for the now the smallest possible um, distance measure. And what's interesting about that is you get this square root of this positive, sem positive definite, semi-definite matrix here, which is a function of this variable gamma which is basically the product of alpha dagger alpha. It's a square matrix. And it satisfies trace gamma is 1 and gamma is positive semi-definite. That's a convex set. So optimizing over gamma, if we were to do that alone, is going to be a convex optimization problem you'll see in a minute. 
The other point is how do you get R out of this to achieve this bound? Well, one way to do it is to take this matrix and form a singular value decomposition. This is a wide matrix, or it could be square, but it's, it's never tall. And then just form the R as the, the, the various uh, left and right singular values, singular, singular vectors. Now these formulas probably exist in a variety of forms and a variety of papers, but this is, this is another form. And this is one way, one way to do this. Now, uh, this is the way you would compute it. Conceptually, it looks like this. Because you're taking square roots and inverses of matrices, you never want to do that really you know, as it looks. You want to do it through a, either eigenvalue or singular value decomposition. So it has this particular form. And this, this side is sort of the square root of this. But that's the way you get R. But R already depends on alpha and C and gamma. Well, gamma depends on alpha. So we need to find those somehow before we can compute, compute R. So one way to construct R from alpha or gamma is the following. So if you have, uh, if, the encoding, if the encoding ancilla dimension exceeds the number of OSR elements in the error system, then this is a construction for alpha, which will achieve the appropriate gamma and then the appropriate R. And interestingly enough, in this particular case, the R matrix, which is the first NC columns of the unitary recovery system, is unitary. So there are no recovery ancilla needed. And this, is, this result, uh, uh, I think, also appeared in this paper by Cribbs and Speck. On the other hand, if the number of ERA OSR elements exceeds the number of encoding ancilla, then now we just take the square root. R is now tall. You need extra recovery ancilla to get to the optimal, uh, the minimum distance measure through R. And of course you might have to pad it because N sub R is two to the something. So the iterative procedure would go like this. You'd have an encoding and now you want to solve for gamma from this function. Uh, let me just back up a second so you can see that. Whoops. Sorry. So here we want to minimize this. There's a minus sign. Nothing else depends on gamma, so we want to maximize this. That's what this is. So it turns out so this is a convex set over gamma. It turns out this is a, an optimization that can be transformed to an SDP, so you can solve for gamma. And then construct R and alpha from the previous construction. Similarly, or not so similarly, but interestingly, if we want to keep minimize the distance, now having R and alpha, we want to solve for the encoding. Well, this is not a convex optimization because this is a, a quadratic equality constraint. However, it turns out magically that the answer can be written down as a constrained least squares problem, uh, which we didn't realize until recently. And so this can be solved exactly through the constrained least squares. Now, again, you would do this with an SVD. So you, you get the uh, singular value decomposition of the least square solution, which is a bunch of matrix products, replace the singular values with identity, and you have the optimal uh, encoding given the recovery and, and the alpha. So the whole algorithm would look like this. And I'm just calling it R gamma C SDP, just to give it a, a name. We can try to name it better than that. Uh, and I'm showing everything here uh, conceptually because you do have to use a singular value decomposition to, to be efficient. So we, we, pick, we either initialize with uh, recovery and encoding, we compute gamma from the SDP, get alpha, uh, stick it into this formula for R, and then compute C and you just keep looping. And each step again, in this case, can only decrease the distance as before we were, we were always never decreasing the fidelity, always increasing it. So then there's a little magic that I recently discovered, which is um, I was curious about the relationship between this fidelity and this distance. And it turns out that, they, that you can get a lower bound, and in fact the lower bound is exact if you minimize the distance strictly over alpha. And here's the formula for alpha, and it's just, a, it's just a, another constrained least squares. So that little piece said, wait a minute, why don't we do this? We'll initialize recovery and encoding, compute alpha from this simple formula, and then just calculate R from the SVD, and until the distance stops decreasing. Um, there's no convex optimization here. It's really basically least squares, or SVD, which is pretty uh, efficient, or, Q, or QR algorithms, if you're familiar with it. Um, 
I thought I had a proof, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty convinced that this returns the same global uh, recovery as we get with the SDP method. But we'll, we'll get that proof. So now we can put all this together. And this is, the, this is why I struck out via convex optimization, because we don't need it. We initialize the encoding and recovery. We compute this alpha. Now we compute R, and then we compute C. And it all looks like constrained least squares. So, again, these are the conceptual forms, not the numerically calculatable forms. Um, this is very fast, because uh, unless you spend the time, nobody has to write really efficient semi-definite programming for this problem, and I'm not sure you can, uh, this is orders of magnitude faster. Um, one more interesting feature about the structure of the recovery, uh, Daniel says this is already in several papers, but uh, not in the form I recognize it. So in the case where the number of uh, error and OSR exceeds the, the encoding in Scylla dimension, if we take the singular value decomposition of alpha, assuming we had it, and plug it back into R, we discover some interesting things. So the first one is that W represents one instance of the unitary freedom in the OSR representation of the error system. And V represents the freedom in the recovery OSR. And in fact, if the system is degenerate and S only has K singular values, it shows immediately that you can reduce the recovery matrix, or reduce the number of OSR elements. So uh, I'll present some examples in a second. Um, it's hard to c compute the computational cost. It's not hard, it's just tedious. That's what I mean. I don't really want to do it, but um, you need to account for a number of things. So I made a table of at least the number of variables. Now, I didn't talk about the dual aspect of SDP. I don't know if Andrew's going to talk about it or not, but you can reduce the number of parameters in the SDP optimization by solving a dual problem, but to go from the dual solution to the primal solution, you have to solve a set of linear equations. So, but that's only one time, and it takes iterations to solve SDPs and so on. So in each of these steps, there's more things that have to be accounted if you really want to you know, add up all the time it's going to take to, to do this. But clearly, these zeros stand out. You're not doing strict optimization unless you want to say SVD is optimization. But it, and I guess you could, but not in this table. A couple of points. Uh, exponential scaling with qubits seems unavoidable, because at least you're dealing with the Hilbert space dimensions. They're 2 to the power of something. So we're not getting rid of that. Don't want to mislead anybody. Um, and both the and the indirect methods also support both the worst case and average case designs, although I'll show you results just with the average case. So here's an example uh, talking more about the process, which is kind of interesting. So here we're looking at a four qubit code with weight two errors, and each error on the channel is, a, is the same unitary, which I picked at random. And the probability of that occurring is 0.2. So we start, so the, let's say we start with the DFS4 code and run the, um, the so-called least squares version, what I call R alpha C, out to 100 iterations. That takes 2.6 seconds on my desktop, which is just your basic Dell computer, 2 gigahertz, I think. If I run the same uh, setup for the SDP algorithm, I get out to... 50 iterations in five minutes. So that's quite a difference. You know, in engineering problems, which I'm familiar with, you don't want these things to take too long because sometimes, you f if it takes too long, you forget the question you asked by the time you get the answer. <laughs> so 2.6 seconds, is, that's good. <laughs> um, what's also interesting about uh, this curve is, is starting from a completely different uh, encoding, and here I picked the, the, no, the no encoding, which is, I guess in this case, 16 by 2 matrix with an identity in the upper, uh, 2 by 2 identity in the top. So that's like nothing. So it starts, for some reason it starts, well, it also start, well, they'll both start around 0.7, but it pops up. And then it seems to do nothing for a while. It only catches some valley in the parameter space and then zooms up. 
Uh, and again, uh, it's still around two and a half seconds, 2.6 seconds, and again, around five minutes for the SDP. So the space is interesting. Um, we'll see a few more of these. Let's see what's next. Oh, yeah, so this is... Uh, in that case, we're able to reduce from the 16 elements that you need in the OSR representation of recovery to 11. And you can see that, to some extent, by looking at, at, at alpha, which in this case is about 8 by 11. But if you look at the singular values of gamma, after 8, there's, they're essentially zero. They're numerically zero. So that explains the reduction. And also, if we went to the recovery process matrix, it's 32 by 32 and also easily reduces to to this uh, eight. Oh, and one more thing. So the iterated encoding is very far from where we started, or reasonably far if you look at the fidelity of the two. This is another interesting plot. So I did 10 runs initialized at random encodings, 16 by 2 encodings, again with the same error system. And uh, for 1,000 runs, uh, it took six, this took six minutes with the least squares version. Most of them seem to be converging in a, in a certain amount of time to some, some value. There's one outlier, and if it ran longer, it would also converge. So it appears that the final fidelities would converge. But here's what's really interesting, is that the encodings and recoveries are all very different from each other. So there's a, I'm pretty convinced that it's not unique. Being not unique is very good. And why is it good? It's good because that means there's a lot of design freedom to try to make these things in the lab under some constraints. If there was no freedom, well, that would be harder. Oh, and then I ran also with 10, uh, I guess, 10 different um, initialized encodings with the STP algorithm. And this was six minutes at 100 iterations. And so to get out to the end from all these would take quite a while. Well, that's about the parameter space. So here we took, um, a case, again, the same case, four qubit code. Wait two single random unitary errors in all the slots and ran um, the probabilities of occurrence from 0 to 0.9. And in each instance, we ran 100 Monte Carlo versions of, of this with different random unitaries. So here's the behavior of the uh, DFS4 code as you increase the probabilities, as you might expect. The triangle and the error bars show what happens over the 100 runs. Uh, the triangles indicate just average case recovery. So we're not optimizing the encoding, just the recovery. And it's, it's, it's better. When we iterate on everything, encoding and recovery, we start to do significantly better. And we get very close to the optimal. The red is the code iterated and optimized in, in encoding and recovery at each value of the parameter. So that's a code, and it's still... A, when you uh, reduce it, it's still a 16 element OSR recovery and it's still a 16 by 2 encoding matrix. But I don't, I don't know that you'd ever be able to find it without the optimization or know that you could do this. So it's, it's, it's important. It says, I can get this huge increase in fidelity with this amount of real estate for this problem. Now, whether you believe this error model is significant or not, that's not the point. The point, is, at least not the way I look at it, the point is you can get this gain. Um, let's look at another example with optimal recovery using 5 qubit. And you can go on and on with this. But So here, what are we doing? We're starting with the 513 encoding. And of course, what you'd hope is that if we had weight two bit flip errors, we would get fidelity one, which we do. And we actually recover what's considered the ideal recovery for the 513 code. And again, we see we can reduce to a 16 element OSR, which means uh, it's, it's a unitary recovery. Notice the times, though. 38, I, I didn't, this is the, this is 38 minutes for the, um, oh no, it's 38 seconds, sorry for the uh, direct SDP, 12 seconds for the SDP on the indirect method, and uh, 60 milliseconds for the, R, the least squares code. 
that little 5x means I had to loop through this thing five times. And then a uh, similar table now with weight three bit flip errors again, same probability. Similar numbers again in time and again everything reduces to 16. Now of course we can't get uh, fidelity one in this particular case. This is again a picture which explains the reduction. So in this particular case, all the elements of the alpha matrix and the gamma matrix, which I know you've long forgotten, are real in this example only. And you can see actually gamma matrix is diagonal. Those are effectively the effective probabilities of the errors. There's only 16 of them. All the action on this occurs in a 16 by 16 block anyway. Oh, this is, this is hard to explain. A lot of arrows. <laughs> Okay, so this is weight two and weight three bit flip errors starting with the 513 encoding. So let's, uh, let's start with that. So for weight, I have to look at the arrows myself. Okay, where are we? Okay, so 513 encoding and recovery on weight two errors as the probability increases from zero to 0.9 follows this curve, which is not so great as you expect. For weight three errors, it follows this other dark curve. So when we optimize or average case with weight two errors, we return a perfect fidelity as expected. And that's, we see that up here. And that, and that was seen already in the first chart that I showed. If we then optimize over weight three errors, then what happens is, and this is optimal now at each error probability, we follow this curve down to here, and then at about a half, or maybe exactly to half, we start to move up. This was a, a similar to a curve demonstrated in the uh, Ryan Paul Werner paper uh, on, on, the, on using the iterative methods. When we then apply the average case optimal to the weight three errors, we fall below the optimal curve, cross at a half, and then rise up. So you get these all these different effects that you could study. Um, in this, with, with, with these tools. I think I've covered it. Maybe not. But anyway, we'll go on. So, let's look again at five qubit, weight three. This is now weight three unitary errors, probably point two. And, I, and, and the reason I want to show you this is that to see how this time scale scales with qubits. I'm not sure how this works. We have to study this, but it's, it's not favorable for using SDP. So we follow this curve all the way out to 100 iterations with the least squares method. It takes 27 seconds. And you, you probably have to go a little longer to get maybe one more digit in here. The, the SDP version takes 84 minutes to get out to 40 iterations. So that is not uh, the way to do this. Particularly if, uh, if my conjecture is correct, these, these are the same. And they look the same in this example, but that's not a proof. Um, and again, starting from a, again, a, a, a no encoding start, uh, it does jump up quite quickly and then takes its time to converge. And this also takes about 27, 28 seconds on the, with the least squares. So, you, so this is giving a little bit of picture of the parameter space that we're optimizing over. It's not straightforward. And here again, we can reduce the 26 elements that you would uh, normally expect in the recovery to 16. And again, all the action, if you look at the singular values of gamma, there's only 16 of them really. The rest are 10 to the minus 10th or something, whatever it was on the computer. And uh, Interestingly, in this problem, the initial encoding, the 513 encoding and the final encoding were close. Uh, the, the recoveries, however, were quite different. This is uh, another example with the five qubit code. So now what we've done is we have weight two errors. Every unitary in the weight two is a different unitary, all randomly selected. So the previous example, one random unitary was selected and plopped in. Now every time we do a run, we randomize every single one of the, uh, I think, the, the, the uh, unitaries. So this is the 513 code against probability. Just the average case recovery pumps you up quite a bit. 
as you can see here. And then the iterated average case and optimal are very, very close. Although a little, optimal is a little bit better in different places. So again, you, you, get, uh, you don't get quite an order of magnitude improvement here, but maybe enough to say, OK, I can live with this amount of uh, encoding or code space real estate. Oh, I'm done. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, certainly the optimal or robust codes have the potential, I think, to mitigate the need for further levels of concatenation. Um, the codes can be tuned for a range of error models. That's the robustness point. Uh, this least squares approach or constrained least squares approach is, seems to be very efficient for calculating these codes and we have to you know, investigate how that really scales. And at least the indirect approach in my mind, and maybe this is already in the literature, I'm sure it is, it reveals a lot of the structure of the recovery uh, f for certain. Uh, a few things, a few things. There's a long list of things that we'd like to do. Uh, I think one of the big ones is to incorporate structure. I mean structure in the error model. And this includes fault tolerant, how that comes in. I mean the standard error model, you know, is it sufficient to take random unitaries and stick them left and right into the error, which you can do in this case. If those represent the fault tolerant behavior you expect, then you can include it. Well, I don't know that for sure. Uh, the non-uniqueness, which, which uh, I haven't established theoretically, but it seems to be established practically, is beneficial, as I said, because it allows you extra design freedom. Now, saying that I have this in the lab and this in the lab, and that's all I've got, this may be very difficult to take these two things and implement the ideal encoding and recovery, but at least you would know the following. You would know the limit of performance. So you couldn't do any better, assuming we had we, we believe the model that we had. Um, and you could then compare it to what you have and say, well, I don't need to expend any more effort. Or you say, oh, there's a huge difference. I, I better think of other ways to do this. Uh, in terms of how this gets implemented on the device, I don't know, because we've got to see the device. It's, it's you've got to be specific to the device. Uh, and again, in terms of implementation, I forget who quoted this to me, but usually comprehensibility overrides optimality but we'll, we'll see how that works out. Uh, another point is um, we have our system. Can we take tomography data somehow, determine what, we're, what we actually have, and then use these tools to tune the existing error system? And you know, what's the character of the landscape? But I think to really make this work, you have to be specific and you know, to, deal with the, oh, to deal with the havoc that Feynman was worried about. Uh, and there's a little issue about uncertainty, which you may <laughs> want to recall. <laughs> um, so you have to include the things. You have to try to include all the things. Anyway, that's, that's it. I can find the slide. You get in there. No, something like this. Now, I think these formulas exist in the literature, maybe not in this form. So this is the recovery, and it's a function of these various parameters. And it, it, this may help implement the scheme in some way. I'm not sure how. Uh, certainly, going from this to um, where to go to this shows how it, things get reduced. So that, that's what I meant. 